At Torrey Pines Bank, our local team of business banking professionals help businesses of all sizes reach their goals. Bank on accountability with Torrey Pines Bank, a division of Western Alliance Bank, member FDIC. Solving complex problems requires collaboration. Making a real impact demands compassion. The Deloitte Health Equity Institute is passionately committed to both in order to advance health equity. Join us in helping build bridges to more equitable outcomes and improved well-being for everyone. Get it for hugs. Get it for haircuts, for birthdays and birthday cakes, for family photos and dreams come true. Get it for holding hands, live shows and movie magic. Get it for prom night and slow dances, for drinks, dessert, and everything in between for the friends who become family. Get it for big swings, big adventures, and the biggest days of your life. Yeah, make me wanna holler Throw up both my hands Oh, 
I am Dr. David Carlisle, President and CEO of Charles R. Drew University of Medicine and Science. I extend a most sincere welcome to all attendees and participants in this, the final installment of our 2021 Virtual Leadership Summit. Co-presented by Blue Shield of California Promise Health Plan and Deloitte. Thank you to all of our, our speakers and panelists, to our sponsors and guests, and everyone in our CDU community, including our Board of Trustees, faculty, staff, students, alumni, friends, and supporters. The 2021 CDU Leadership Summit, Health Equity and Social Justice, is a four-part series where we align leaders in the health, education, social justice, corporate, and philanthropy sectors to identify inequities affecting people of color and introduce strategies to address them. The topic for today's discussion is racial equity and social justice, the intersection of corporate responsibility and racial equity. We will spend most of the next hour delving into this important topic, first in a conversation with our featured speaker and then with the wonderful panel we have joining us today. As it has been all year and for some time before that, racial equity remains a recurring and prevalent topic of discussion on many levels. There was a time when only people of color were having that conversation. Now it is something that is discussed across practically all demographics and segments of society. It is, a, it is finally a national discussion. Unfortunately, this is often driven by the latest court case that highlights some of the darkest forms that racial disparity can take. Disappointingly, while these instances are used as a rallying cry and call for progress for some, others utilize these moments as a dog whistle to marshal a push against progress. While this keeps the conversation going, productivity toward achieving racial equity suffers, as do the people who feel the effects of such inequities. Today, for this forum at least, we seek to elevate the discussion. We will ask some obvious and some hard questions about how leaders can address and advance racial equity in their organizations, about how those organizations can help move our society forward, or at the very least, not hold us back. Personally, as a leader of a learning institution of medicine and science, racial equity is often framed through the concept of health equity. That's the most obvious application, and I would love, I would love to be, I would be doing my job to some degree if that was all I focused on. It's typically easy to focus on the most obvious facet of a problem or a challenge, but there are often many ways to frame and apply concepts of racial equity. For someone in my position, Racial equity needs to extend to CDU's hiring practices, admissions policies, curriculum, community engagement, how we distribute and spend the money, the grant money we receive. It's a continuous and layered process that requires forethought and hindsight at the same time. Many of those may be true for you as well. There are probably 100 different ways to look at racial equity in your organization in any corporation. It is important to take the time to identify those many ways, to look at it from all angles, to help understand the nature and state of racial equity that an organization exists in. Only then can you gain a wider comprehension of it, how to address it, how to foster it from within and from the outside. It requires the ability to make an honest and unflinching assessment of where your organization is now and where it should be. It means not just accepting racial equity, but also seeking a way to be a racial equity influencer as a person and as an entity, to shift paradigms, and sometimes to take risks in the name of progress. So how do you balance all of that? That's what we're going to discuss today with some great minds who have come together to provide their perspectives. Our audience today includes decision makers and future leaders managers, and students. 
It is our intention that you will come away from today's event with some insight into how you can be part of supporting, shaping, and advancing racial equity. It is happening, has to happen, at every level, from large movements to small actions. We can see that there is momentum right now in our time, in this moment. It is up to everyone, each and every one of us, to help turn that momentum into progress, hope into fate, and dreams into reality. Today's program will include a one-on-one -on -one conversation with our featured guest, as well as an extended discussion with the panel that has gathered today to put this very important topic on the table. First, I'd like to introduce Jennifer Radin from this event's leadership co-sponsor, Deloitte. As a founding partner for Deloitte's Health Equity Institute, Ms. Radin works to enable healthcare system executives to embrace disruptive transformation, helping them leverage applied innovation to design new models of clinical care and future-proof their business. Following her remarks, you will hear from Perry Chen, Director of Social Impact for Blue Shield of California, the event's presenting sponsor. Mr. Chen designs and implements strategies that contribute toward the company's social responsibility goals. And he will also return later in the program to join our panel for a lively discussion. And then I will return following remarks from Ms. Radin and Mr. Chen to introduce our featured speaker with whom I will engage in a direct conversation about today's topic. For now, please join me in welcoming Jennifer Radin. Dr. Carlisle, thank you so much for your very, very kind introduction, uh, your amazing opening remarks that were both inspiring and of course so insightful. Um, it's an honor to be here with you all today. We're so excited to serve as a sponsor for CDU's Leadership Summits partnering together to increase the engagement of leaders in health equity, have open dialogues about structural racism, and discuss impactful strategies to promote a more equitable and resilient health ecosystem. And of course, the topic of today's Leadership Summit, the intersection of corporate responsibility and racial equity could not be more relevant or more urgent in today's world. As ESG is increasingly the topic of boardrooms and C-suites, companies around the world are making a concerted effort to align with global ESG principles and guidelines and voluntarily adopt and implement various practices to address emerging challenges and stakeholder expectations across the ESG spectrum. We're very excited about this at Deloitte because it provides an important way in and window to talk about racial equity and health equity. If you think about it, ESG is really about raising the health in the broadest context of organizations. In addition to carbon netting, the E for environment, of course, focuses on challenges like clean water, healthy air, and the reduction of lead in our physical structures, all of which, as we know, will help to promote the root causes of chronic and acute conditions, asthma, upper respiratory conditions, cancers, cardiac disease. The G, of course, focuses on governance, business ethics, and culture in order to promote healthy organizations. However, the S has been historically a little bit amorphous. At Deloitte, we believe the social element encompasses health and racial equity, improving the health equity of populations and eliminating disparities amongst people of color and across gender. S equals HE is what we like to say. In this country, as we know, Black Americans represent 13% of the U.S. population, but possess only 4% of the nation's household wealth, according to Brookings. And this wealth disparity is a significant driver of health that has a significant impact on the health and well-being of Black populations. Just a few data points that I know we're all well aware of, but that really, I think, paint the picture. Black, black people are 2.8% times more likely to be hospitalized for, for COVID than white counterparts. Black babies have a low birth weight two times more frequently than white babies. Black women are two and a half times more likely not to receive prenatal care sufficiently through their pregnancy. And black populations in this country are nearly two times more likely to die 
from heart disease and stroke than their white counterpart populations. This obviously is an unacceptable situation that we're all living in. We believe that health equity is a moral imperative that requires business solutions. And early in the spring, we launched the Deloitte Health Equity Institute, a social innovation research in action organization. At the Institute, our mandate is to create measurable impact and raise health for populations experiencing disparities because of race, gender, sexuality, or socioeconomic factors. And we do this in collaboration with community organizations as well as our life sciences and healthcare clients and partners. We do this through three integrated pillars of action. The first, activating key decision makers, part of why I'm so excited to be here today with you all, including boards, C-suites, community leaders, to create a domino effect of health equity actions and change across both private and public sectors. We're so excited to have recently launched the health equity playbook for boards along with the Black Directors Health Equity Association. The second pillar is creating place-based change to strengthen equitable communities, developing health equity ecosystems in select high need geographies, and accelerating existing place-based change efforts, strengthening connecting key players, working with trusted community members to break down silos. The third is driving health equity innovation and learning across the country. We do this by leveraging Deloitte assets, partnerships with national actors and players to catalyze and incubate innovative thinking and drive health equity change and learning at scale. All of the assets that we create for the Institute are available to everyone and can be pulled down from our website. And we really encourage people to do that and use them. One example of the work we've done is our longstanding relationship with Common Spirit, the whole leadership team. And currently we're working together on a vaccine outreach program in California and Arkansas. And as you'll soon hear, Marvin O'Quinn is a dynamic leader in the health equity space. And we're very excited and honored to be able to drive change together. Achieving health equity requires leaders to intentionally dismantle broken systems and deliberately collaborate to enable every individual to achieve their full potential in all aspects of health and of well-being. As humans, parents, siblings, students, business leaders, academics, taxpayers, citizens, we believe we all play a role in shaping a more equitable future with greater access and the ability for everyone to thrive. So thank you for having us today. We're thrilled to be here. Let me hand it over to Perry Chen. Good morning, everyone. My name is Perry Chen. I'm the Director of Social Impact for Blue Shield of California. I'm honored to be here today on behalf of Blue Shield of California's Promise Health Plan, which offers Medi-Cal and Cal MediConnect healthcare programs that provide free or low cost health coverage to Californians. The mission of Blue Shield of California is to create a healthcare system that's worthy of our family and friends and sustainably affordable for everyone. Our health plan offers distinct services for more than 400,000 members that we serve in Los Angeles and the San Diego counties. Moreover, Blue Shield of California has a longstanding commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion and belonging. It's been a part of our company's DNA for decades. And this year, we've renewed and expanded our efforts to challenge racism and other forms of discrimination, both inside our own walls and inside the healthcare system. We know that racial disparities exist on many fronts in healthcare, from obtaining health education to receiving adequate and appropriate care to having access to culturally competent medical professionals. And we're deepening our efforts to address health inequity wherever it exists, particularly in Black and Latinx communities where the disparities are greater, deeper, and long, <laughs> long held. Our specific commitments in this area include championing DEI in our workforce and our workplace. We know that this work starts with our own house. We're supporting health equity also through the equitable distribution of COVID-19 vaccines during our time as the state's third party administrator of California's COVID-19 distribution. We're also aligning business growth with initiatives like supplier diversity, and we're advocating for social justice by investing in communities where we live and where we work. As a nonprofit, we're the only major health plan in California that caps its net income at 2% and pledges to return its funds above and beyond that level 
back to our members and to the communities where we serve. You know, finally, as we're coming together today to talk about race, equity, and social justice, I'd like to close with a thought about Blue Shield's pillar around standing for what's right and how we wanna do our part to dismantle structural racism in healthcare and build a just system to replace it. About 10 years ago, I was working in the Oakland public school system and we were studying a report that had just come out a few years earlier from the Alameda Public Health Department called Life and Death from Unnatural Causes. We looked at a long range of data across the city and the county. And there was a pullout in the report that I remember. And then what it said was, when you compare a white child who was born in the Oakland Hills with an African-American child born in West Oakland, these are some of the things you find. And this really builds on Jen's um, data. That black child in West Oakland is at 1.5 times more likely to be born premature or have low birth weight. They're seven times more likely to be born into poverty. They're more likely to live in a neighborhood that's a food desert with two times the concentration of liquor stores and more fast food outlets. As they grow up, they'll be 5.6 times more likely to get pushed out of school. They'll be five times more likely to get hospitalized for diabetes, and they're three times more likely to die of stroke. And at the bottom of the pullout, there was one sentence that said, this child can expect to die almost 15 years earlier than the white person who was born in Oakland Hills. And if you know Oakland, West Oakland and the Oakland Hills can be as close as a mile and a half apart. So if we were in person right now, I'd probably ask you to turn to a partner and think about 2006. What happened in that year for you? You know, maybe you were in school, maybe you had started a new job and share with the person, everything has happened to you since then. You know, maybe you moved into your first apartment, maybe you finished school and started something new. Maybe you met somebody that you wanted to spend your life with. Maybe you stopped being with that person. Maybe you met someone else. Maybe you got a pet. Maybe you lost somebody. And we think about everything that's happened to you in those 15 years. And then imagine that in a snap, like an Avenger-like snap, all of that disappears. And so we talk about the technical parts of dismantling racism in the system but I think undergirding that, I think about this a lot, that when we talk about health equity and race, we talk about having to have that conversation among so many talks that we have with our black kids and saying there are 15 years now. And the reason that death is unnatural is because it's completely preventable. It's not something that we can't stop. It's not something that we don't know the solutions to. It is absolutely preventable. And that's the fire I think that's underneath us when we talk about race equity, when we talk about health, and we need to have a vision for our future where your skin color and your zip code don't determine how long you live. So together with the support of our employers and business leaders in our community, we can help to improve racial and health equity. We can help to reduce the barriers to access to quality care because we know the answers to that and we know how to stop it so that we don't have to have that conversation. So again, I wanna thank all the folks at CDU Dr. Car Carlisle, Jen, for queuing this up. Uh, it's an honor and privilege to sponsor today's event, and we're really looking forward to the conversations. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Raiden and uh, Mr. Chen. Wonderful remarks, appreciate that. And now I have the pleasure of introducing today's featured speaker, Marvin O'Quinn. Mr. O'Quinn has been the President and Chief Operating Officer of Common Spirit Health in San Francisco since February of 2019. Mr. Quinn's accountabilities at Common Spirit Health include system operations, physician enterprise, performance improvement, service area and market management, supply chain, and operational transformation. He also joined Dignity Health in 2009 and served as Senior Executive Vice President and Chief Operations Officer. Previously, he served as president of Jackson Health System and held leadership positions with New York Presbyterian Health System and Providence Medical Center in Portland, Oregon. Mr. O'Quinn holds a bachelor's degree in biology and a master's degree in health administration from the University of Washington in Seattle. 
Additionally, he has served as a guiding light to Charles Arger University as chair of CDU's Board of Trustees from 2013 to 2018. We are honored to have him back with us today to once again share his insight and perspectives. Welcome, Marvin. Thank you, David. Great to be back. So I have um, uh, questions for you, Marvin, and uh, let me All just right. go ahead and, and comment and say that it's been an eventful time for racial equity. It's moved to mainstream conversations, some very heated, in living rooms, boardrooms, school board meetings, on talk shows, in comedic mon monologues, the halls of government, and legislative chambers. These conversations are not just being had by people of color. For the first time in a long time, racial equity is part of the national conversation on just about at every level. So my first question is a high level one. From your perspective, as the president and COO of one of the nation's largest nonprofit health systems, has all this conversation made a difference on the ground toward achieving health equity? How so, or why not? Well, I think the, the answer to that question is a definite maybe or maybe it's too early to see uh, what the results are going to be. Uh, what I can say is what I have observed uh, is certainly a lot of momentum and a lot of movement across the country amongst uh, the corporate world, if you will, towards really focusing in uh, on this issue uh, with a lot of efforts and a lot of programming uh, many organizations have uh, hired diversity and equity uh, officers. We have done so here at Common Spirit Health. Uh, I sit on a number of boards of uh, publicly traded companies that also have done the same thing, and I can have observed the programming that they're putting in place uh, in those organizations. And and those uh, and the good news is that those executives are making direct reports uh, to the board. So there is certainly a lot of momentum. Uh, I think it would be cynical, a little bit cynical to say we've been here before. We've certainly had uh, major events occur that mobilized the country and then things sort of petered out and went back to the way they've always been. I'm hopeful uh, that this time around uh, that uh, the momentum that we have will be sustained. I'm certainly seeing a lot of change. There's a lot of conversation uh, and there's a lot of programming going on. So I am hopeful, but I think it's really early to say that it has, has really made a, a big difference from where we were. Uh, and the question is, will all this momentum stay and will it stick uh, and produce changes down the line? Great, uh, thank you, um, Mr. O'Quinn. Let's go on to our next question. As someone from the nation's leading provider of Medicaid services, what role do you see the government playing in helping other organizations pursue equity in healthcare or social justice in general? What obstacles exist to this type of synergy between the public, the government, nonprofits, and for-profit corporations? So there are, you know, there are a number of areas where I think the federal government could really uh, drive home uh, this issue around access and equity in health care. Uh, and they start with supporting uh, the hospitals and physician groups that, uh, that already exist that are serving these communities. As you are probably aware, there's been an effort in the last couple of years to roll back dish payments. Uh, these displacement payments are part of what keeps these hospitals afloat uh, in these communities, and so they could certainly slow that down or not do that at all. Another area, of course, is the funding of residency programs associated with historically black colleges and universities or hospitals that have relationships with them, because what we need is more diversity amongst our medical uh, force that is willing to and wanting to go back and practice uh, in these communities. The issues that get in the way are always the same. It's bureaucracy, uh, it's silos within governmental entities, uh, it is institutional inertia, 
uh, that can get in the way. And it always comes down to dollars and how those dollars are distributed, how they're prioritized, uh, and whether or not this issue is a priority to the people who are making those decisions. Historically, I guess we could say, based on the evidence we've seen, that it has not been. And hopefully, as we go forward in the future, uh, it certainly will be. Uh, I've worked for governmental entities in the past, uh, as I know that you have as well. And so I know you're familiar with the push and pull that constituents have on governmental leaders when it comes to how dollars are prioritized and where they're spent. Uh, and there's no question that there's a lot of that that goes on. So you need to have a very loud voice and use our advocate, advocacy platforms uh, to demand and have our voices heard because that's really a key to the change that we seek. You know, Marvin, um, I, I've known you for um, you know many years, and uh, and we've worked together. Yeah. And I'm I'm going off script here a little bit, uh, well, significantly, because I, I think you identified a very significant issue for CDU um, back in 2007 when uh, King Drew LA County King Drew Medical Center closed. South Los Angeles lost 15 residency programs and over 300 residency positions. Um, fast forward to today, CDU has reestablished three of those programs, psychiatry, mm -hmm. family medicine, and internal medicine, but there's still 12 more to go. And I will say that, um, as, as you just said, this has been a major challenge for us. We are struggling to identify clinical partners to house residency training programs here in Los Angeles. Um, the beds exist. The organizations exist, but CDU has to work very hard to make progress to establish those programs. I, I don't know, Marvin, if you want to speak to that further. Well, you know, I, I was, you know, you know I, I grew up in Los Angeles, and I recall when all of that occurred, and I, I am certainly familiar with your work uh, to, uh, to to bring these residencies back to those communities. Uh, and it's, there's no question that um, the hospitals and the healthcare facilities face economic consequences when, uh, if they're having to add positions that are over their caps. Uh, and there's no relief on that in the way that the Medicare or the government funds these residency positions. Uh, we are hopeful that in the new dollars that are coming out in, in, the, in, the, in the President's plan, that there will be additional dollars to support these types of programs. Because the hospitals are so so stressed financially, it's very difficult for them uh, to spend above their existing caps. So it creates a kind of a catch-22. Uh, you want to serve the community, but you don't have the funding to do it. Uh, and if you and if you do fund it over your cap, you risk your own financial health. And so it, it creates a very difficult position for the healthcare leaders. Uh, hopefully, um, the government, uh, in its wisdom, will will see this. And I think through uh, voices such as your own and and uh, maybe mine and certainly that of my CEO, Lloyd Dean, and others, we can get that through uh, to the people who are making decisions about how the funds are distributed. Wonder wonderful, wonderful. Uh, I'll, I'll just close by, by saying that um, uh, in addition to, uh, to your organization, organizations, um, leadership in this area, uh, CDU has, has benefited from um, funding from local government, um, Los Angeles County, recognizing the importance of our graduates <coughs> in the county healthcare uh, infrastructure, has funded our uh, psychiatry residency position, has funded our family medicine position, and is helping to fund our internal medicine uh, position in the absence of federal funds uh, to do so. And I agree with you, this is the type of innovative uh, funding that's necessary to achieve the right balance and distribution of GME uh, that is needed to, to address some um, uh, the, the healthcare disparities that we're talking about. Let me go on to our next uh, uh, question. Um, what strategies do you use and what advice can you offer other leaders and managers looking to keep racial equity front and center across an entire organization? We all know that it has to go beyond issuing a mission statement so what does it take to get on a day-to-day -day basis across an organization? So I, I, it, it really starts with really two pretty simple word, words, uh, purple, purposefulness uh, and intent. Uh, and to me, that means it starts at the very top of the organization, uh, meaning the board of governors or the board of trustees, 
or the board of directors, depending upon you know what your operational status is. Moving towards the CEO uh, and the executive leadership team. Uh, specific goals and objectives should be built into your strategic plan. And then the leadership team should be financially incentivized to, to achieve those goals. So at Common Spirit Health, that's, that's exactly what we've done. We've just completed a, a five-year strategic plan. In that plan are very specific goals around uh, approaching uh, issues of disparity and equity uh, and justice. Uh, justice is a key part of why we exist as part of our mission. Uh, and uh, those goals are built into our five-year plan and then they're built into our annual plan. Uh, and there is financial incentive to the executives for achieving uh, those goals. When you look at it from a day-to-day -day basis, those goals can't just sit at the executive level. They have to cascade down through the organization. Uh, and also would encourage every organization to, uh, particularly if they can't afford it on uh, size, to have an equity officer. I have seen what equity officers can do in terms of not just you know the analytics, but creating the practical programs and services within an institution that allows all of its employees to feel at home in, it, in that institution and to feel like they can speak out in a safe place uh, and to feel uh, that they can be their actual selves. They're what people refer to as their authentic selves. That makes for a healthy culture it produces greater productivity, it drives more innovativeness and creativity, uh, and it makes a, just a better organization. So cascade the goals down uh, and have folks working on specific programming to work with your own employees. Because you know, a lot of times we're looking externally about what we can do in the community, but in large companies, you have communities within your company. You have racial disparity and racial issues right inside of your own organization that need to be addressed. And to the extent that you can address them, you can, in fact, improve the culture of your organization and make your organization a better place to work. And in this environment where finding employees is very, very difficult, any advantage you can get will be a plus. Marvin, thank you. Uh, uh, our last question here. Um, healthy people make healthy and stronger communities. Common Spirit works across a system of 140 hospitals and more than 1,000 care sites in 21 states. Uh, that puts you in a lot of communities. How does an organization leverage on-the-ground access like that to further its mission or goals? If the organization doesn't have the inherent community access like Common Spirit Health does, how do they go about fostering it? So um, we have, a, as I mentioned earlier, we have a strategic plan for the company. Uh, and then every uh, part of our company is required to set up a strategic plan of its own based on the specific dynamics of the geographies in which they are serving. Uh, and so the goals that I mentioned earlier around disparity, equity, and, and et cetera, cascade down through the organization into our hospitals, which are serving the local communities. Healthcare, by and large, is a local issue. And so whether or not, you know, what we do in Chicago or in San Francisco may have no bearing on what's going on uh, in Williston, North Dakota. So the hospital leaders in our system, we asked our leaders to be leaders, not just inside of their hospitals, but to be leaders inside of their communities, uh, to become active members uh, in those communities. Uh, to get not just donate funds, but to donate time uh, and to encourage and have their leadership teams and their managers also actively involved uh, in those communities. And through that and through those types of connections, we're able to leverage and help those communities prosper in ways other than just taking care of them when they become sick. Uh, and it also allows us to, in fact, focus in on areas of uh, equity and uh, disparities that we might not otherwise see if we just stayed inside the walls of our institution. So I certainly would encourage, and, and, and you know, actually this has been a natural part of healthcare for years. It's not just us uh, that has these types of relationships with our communities. Uh, every healthcare system that I've worked in throughout my career has in fact uh, embedded themselves in their communities. Uh, many hospitals exist physically in residential communities their neighbors are right across the street. 
So you can't afford to simply put up a wall around your hospital and stay inside of it. You have to reach out and be a part of that community. And my guess is most hospitals do that. Those that don't, I would strongly suggest that they do. Again, if you want to serve your community as we move away from sort of the sick care model, uh, you, we have to understand that there are other things affecting the lives of people other than just acute health care. And there, we are in a position to help them in those areas uh, just as, as well. Well, thank you, Marvin. As always, it's been a pleasure and an eye-opener <laughs> chatting with you. Uh, we appreciate your taking the time today to share your thoughts and perspectives. And I just want to say um, at CDU, we appreciate everything that you've done for us in terms of your personal leadership of our university. And we also appreciate everything that Common Spirit and Dignity Health have done for us in the way of supporting us as a university and supporting the community that we exist to serve. Thank you, Marvin. It's our pleasure. It's great to see you again. And I have to say, I, I miss you guys. And hopefully uh, I'll be able to see you guys again in person sometime soon. All right. Sounds good. Next up, we're very fortunate today to have assembled a knowledgeable and dynamic collection of four panelists who will continue the very important conversation started by Marvin O'Quinn. This includes Martha Santana Chin. Ms. Santana Chin currently serves as HealthNet's Medi-Cal president, providing executive oversight to HealthNet's Medi-Cal program. She has more than three decades of healthcare leadership experience working with independent physician practices and hospitals, federally qualified health centers, and health plans serving Medi-Cal and low-income communities. Ms. Santana Chen, who grew up in extreme poverty, prides herself on understanding firsthand the struggles that many Medi-Cal enrollees face. Those challenges include food insecurity and transportation issues and go all the way to, health, to homelessness and health inequities, among other social determinants of health. We're also joined by Marcia Chu, former Vice President of Community Relations for Wells Fargo, where she's centered on reinvestment in and revitalization of low-income communities through corporate philanthropy and community development. She has held director-level positions in municipal government and at two national museums. In her capacity as the Executive Director of the Asian Pacific American Dispute Resolution Center, Marcia was at the forefront of race relations conflict resolution around boycotts, protests, and public policy disputes in the aftermath of the 1992 uprising and civil unrest in Los Angeles. We also have with us today, world-renowned music producer, composer, and musician, Ricky Minor. He has served as musical director for numerous superstar tours, including Whitney Houston, Christina Aguilera, Ray Charles, Alicia Keys, and Beyonce. His work as musical director for television productions includes the Grammy Awards, the NAACP Image Awards, the Super Bowl, and this year's Primetime Emmy Awards. He has received 12 Primetime Emmy Award nominations for outstanding music direction and won two of them for Taking the Stage, African American Music and Stories That Changed America in 2017 and the Kennedy Center Honors in 2020. Rounding out our panel is Perry Chen, Director of Social Impact for Blue Shield of California, who you heard from earlier today. Mr. Chen oversees corporate grant making, employee volunteerism and giving, as well as Blue Sky, a signature initiative regarding youth mental health. Over the past 25 years, Mr. Chen has worked in the field of public education, youth development and law, with a focus on equity and quality for children and families, who are the furthest from opportunities. Prior to Blue Shield, he has served as the Chief Strategy Officer for the Stewart Foundation and was a Chief of Staff for the Oakland Unified School District. He has also, among other roles, been the Board President of the Partnership for Children and Youth, a policy advocate with Children Now, and a public interest civil rights law professor. Additionally, he served as Executive Director for the Youth Arts Nonprofit City Step. Needless to say, I'm excited about this opportunity to facilitate a discussion with and among this amazing lineup of panelists. All of you watching along can participate as well by entering any questions you have for the panel through the event interface on Teams. Time allowing, we will get to some of those following our guided panel discussion. 
So thank you to all four of you for making the time today. <clears throat> so our first question. For Martha Santana Chen, Medi-Cal president of HealthNet, how does a large healthcare organization keep itself in check in relation to health equity? In other words, how do you measure where your organization is and how well it is progressing toward achieving or maintaining health equity? So um, first of all, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. And um, it's an absolute pleasure to sit on a panel with such esteemed colleagues. Um, and, you know, to speak about this very important topic, you know, one of the things that um, is very special about HealthNet is that we're very, very passionate about the work that we do. Um, many of the folks that work at HealthNet have so stories similar to, to mine. Um, we grew up in environments that were less than um, optimal, um, and many of us kind of worked through uh, and uh, beat the odds. And so we're here to serve. And it, it's uh, again, it's it's a very uh, it's an issue that's very near and dear to our hearts. Um, so I mean, I think it's a really, really, really good question. And I think um, to echo some of the comments that were made earlier. One of the things that we really understand, appreciate, and acknowledge is that as an organization, it is our responsibility to recognize that it really does start with us, right? Holding ourselves accountable, making sure that we're uh, focused on delivering on diversity and inclusion and health equity goals through our performance management process. Um, we align our goals from the all levels of the organization to make sure that we're all driving towards a, a common end. And, you know, part of that really requires that we increase our own internal knowledge and confidence and commitment to advancing um, health equity, diversity and inclusion within our organization and among our, our associates. Um, we, we we're very focused on making sure that we have teams serving the communities that reflect the communities that we serve. Um, our race and ethnic mix um, very much mirrors that of all of the communities that we serve. And being um, one of the largest Medi-Cal plans in the state, um, the overwhelming majority of the people that we serve happen to be people of color. And so that just kind of uh, demonstrates our commitment to, to uh, aligning, right? And we, we, it's, not, it's not enough for us to make sure that we look like the people we serve. We also have to recognize that we have to keep our employees engaged, actively engaged. And so we do things like making sure that we're stratifying employee engagement results by race and ethnicity um, dimensions so that we understand whether or not um, we're connecting and taking advantage of all of the value that they bring in and harness the diverse perspective that they bring to the table. Um, mentorship programs along the lines to make sure that we're helping people on their professional journey and assuming um, progressive levels of leadership in their careers and as we're looking at bringing in new talent, making sure that we have diverse candidates, slates and interview panels. So those are some of the goals that we have for ourselves and our workforce. Part of it requires that, you know, we have a, a focus on cultural competency and implicit bias training. Um, so we do require as part of that goal setting process that 100 percent of our associates and employees um, uh, take accountability for that. And similarly, we spread um, curriculum and, and development and training into the network uh, of providers that serves the members um, that are our responsibility to serve. So, you know, we spread it beyond even our own four walls to make sure that we're um, enabling the community to do right by um, or, you know, approach things through a uh, equity lens. Um, you know, the other the other thing is just, you know, basic data, understanding major patterns of health equities among our members. So we uh, look at our um, quality data as an example and look at it through race, ethnicity, lenses. We're working on making sure that we're capturing SOGI data to be able to advance our work from that perspective as well. And stratifying information in that way really helps us to target interventions in a way that's going to get at the heart of the underlying issues that are afflicting the neighborhoods that we serve and partnering with providers in uh, very effective ways. 
you know, data is imperfect. I think um, we'll, we could probably all recognize that data is imperfect. And so what we try to do is layer um, health, the Healthy Places Index and other uh, community-based data with self-reported information that we get from our members, claims, pharmacy, and other um, data. Again, all in the spirit of trying to make sure that as we are looking to, to understand what the needs of our membership is, it's very, very targeted and that we do it in partnership with subject matter experts in that space to meet the need for you know the, the areas that we're uh, looking to focus on. Um, and you know one of the things that we do recognize um, and we hear time and again is that in order for us to really make a difference, it's not something that we can go at alone, right? Um, it's really important that we create as much alignment as we possibly can across the industry to drive maximum um, impact. And so we often focus with the health plans, with the state, with our provider community, um, make sure that we take a page from the regulators in terms of their areas of focus so that as we uh, ask our provider organizations to really focus on advancing and improving quality, we're not all asking them to chase, you know, a hundred different measures. We're trying to be very focused. And so just as an example, uh, for 2022, we are doing our darnest to make sure that our incentive plans and our priority focus areas are aligning with the measures that NCQA, the Department of Managed Healthcare, Department of Healthcare Services and others are rallying around and have identified as um, areas to focus to in the health equity space. A couple of examples are colorectal cancer, cancer screenings, uh, prenatal postpartum care, et cetera. Um, and you know, just lastly on the measurement side, it's, it's, it's uh, understanding the data, equipping our people, making sure that we have the right level of partnership is just the beginning. Once we identify that, we have to be honest with ourselves, set really, you know, goals that are smart, goals that are uh, measurable, that we know that we're gonna be able to drive in advance and looking at it, right? Making sure that the impact that we intend to make, we actually did make. And if for whatever reason we didn't hit the mark, that we take that learning opportunity to continue with, you know, incremental progress over time. So, you know, it really is um, an all hands in approach. Um, it begins with data, our people, our partners, and um, our community. Well, Martha, thank you uh, for those, uh those uh, words and comments, and thank you for that perspective, and you know, thank you for everything that HealthNet is doing as well. Uh, let's go on to um, our next panelist, uh, Marsha Chu, uh, former Vice President of Community Relations for Wells Fargo. So Marsha, you have extensive experience in community relations. Uh, there's always talk about working with communities of color to advance health equity. My question flips that a bit. What role can a corporation play in getting the message about racial equity into communities that are not of color and perhaps not actively pursuing a racial equity agenda. Thank you, Dr. Carlisle. Um, and thank you for the invitation to join you this morning. Um, I think community relations and corporate philanthropy are the best jobs to have at a bank, at a financial institution. Um, people tend to like folks that give away money and it's, Part of the job of community relations is really to be embedded in the community. As Mr. O'Quinn mentioned, um, it's important to, to be a part of the community and to know the community and to know the needs and also to acknowledge the assets in the community. Um, and so I think that first corporations, in order to be effective, have to listen and learn and turn to their community confidants for advice and counsel. And I think particularly at this time, it's important that they um, converse with their community confidants to learn about what equity truly means. I think we still need to define what equity means and the implications for particularly communities of color. Um, because equity is not about giving equal portions and the same amount. Um, equity is not 
the same as equality. And we need to um, really have that deeper conversations with the community. Um, and so it's important that a corporation and its corporate leadership leverage their position and their power amongst their cohorts in other industries, whether it's um, a peer CEO and other business leaders, um, elected officials, um, the concept of to whom much is given, much is required on any measurement of success in our society, corporate leaders are at the top of the game, wealth, power, and privilege. And so it's an obligation and a responsibility for corporate leaders to use that power and that privilege to um, work in their spheres of influence. And I think that's one way that, um, you know, corporations not only look to communities, but to um, be effective in their spheres of influence. And, um, and I, also like to, I also like to speak about that it's really in their enlightened self-interest. Um, being uh, a responsible corporate citizen is a, positively impacts the bottom line. Um, it's about being responsive and being um, in community because you're Corporations are part of the community. And, um, and I think, Dr. Carlisle, you mentioned that with the passage of Citizens United, it was determined that corporations are more like people. And so I think they have a tremendous responsibility to act responsibly. Um, and in some ways, helping communities build wealth uh, is a way to further impact the corporate bottom line. Um, and for those who don't act in enlightened self-interest, we have legislation and laws like the Community Reinvestment Act, particularly for um, financial institutions, which mandates that they do business and meet the credit needs of communities where they are chartered to do business and, and focus on the needs of low-income communities. And so for those of you who may know, um, federal regulators examine banks regularly and give them the all important um, rating, whether they're outstanding operators or whether they're in compliance or out of compliance. And that, again, impacts corporate earnings and the ability for corporations to expand and grow their business. And so it behooves them to make certain that racial equity is practiced and acted across the board. Marsha, as always, uh, thank you for a, a, a most uh, contemplative and illuminating um, answer to that question as well. Thank you for being on our panel. Uh, next up is a question for world-renowned music producer, composer, and musician, Ricky Minor. As an artist, among other talents, how can corporate America harness the influence of the arts to advance efforts toward racial equity. Conversely, what role can you and other artists and celebrities play in encouraging corporate America to actively be part of the solution? Ricky. Hi, um, thank you for having me on. Um, I grew up uh, not too far from uh, Charles Drew Medical Center and um, I grew up in the uh, Jordan Downs projects and I mean, this is a very um, emotional conversation for me, uh, having lived through, uh, you know, the riots and, and the up uprising in 92 and, and uh, all the, the emotional side of it, you know, of how we can join together. But I think that um, I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic that we are making strides and doing so. And I think the entertainment community is looking to see how they can embrace and give back um, and, and kind of each one teach one. But it's, it's uh, 
was heart wrenching when you see the disparity in in healthcare and access to healthcare and knowledge, just the general knowledge of what to do. And uh, with this pandemic, it has just exploded the fact that we are all we're all the same, yet we don't have the same access. You know, we all have families, we all have have our loved ones. Um, and in my own family, I see, uh, you know, my siblings that didn't uh, get the opportunities and didn't uh, weren't able to navigate through the the elite system that is for uh, for some, but not for most. And so to education, to knowledge, to healthcare and how we, what healthcare is even available. I mean, I, I you know, I speak to a lot of, uh, of homeless, you know, all throughout the city and just have a conversation. And I'm, I'm moved to stop and talk and see what can be done. And they have no idea what to do, where to go, how to even get started. And so the healthcare and the underserved communities is almost non-existence. And I've had, you know, friends and family who, because of lack of access, uh, you know, didn't didn't make it through their illness and, and passed away. And so this is um, it has to change. And so what we do and how we do it really matters. And how we communicate and how we connect with people who feel like no one cares. So why should I even go to the hospital? They're not going to see me. They're not going to to hear or, you know, I get I get come back or we're totally booked, especially now. I mean we're totally I can't get an appointment for, for three months yet this is a lot of issue, but I can't they don't see me. Yeah, uh, Ricky, I, 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 I think we lost your audio feed there for a second. No, no, I, I had no words. I just, you know, I'm just totally uh, overwhelmed with, with just the, the thought when you just stop a moment and for all of us in your own lives and as we try to move this needle forward and how we try to engage and make a change. I mean, I, I serve as as co-chair of diversity for the television academy for the last seven years and you know the numbers are slowly changing there, there is change and there is momentum but this is a a, a, a human issue you know this is this is not a, a, about the have and the have nots and the color of your skin and where you live this is a human issue where where is the the empathy for those who don't have access to health care. Where is that? And and you can't, you know, I, I, I know you, you can't guilt someone into participating or you can't make them, you can't make it a a, 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 a mandate, you know, for, for companies, but it has to, all of this happens from within. And we all know it's inside out, not outside in. So we have to go inside of our hearts, each and every person, to see what can I do to participate and to help. Well, Ricky, um, thank you for those um, uh, passionate and um, supportive and empathetic uh, comments. I, um, it's 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 wonderful to hear that you're a product of uh, Jordan Downs, right around the corner from our university, and I, I think that your comments speak to how healthcare for 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 us and this issue for us. Is a, is a personal issue, as well as a community issue, as well as a corporate issue, because so many of us have family members, and even ourselves, we've experienced what it means firsthand to um, to suffer from healthcare disparities. And uh, again, this is this is not just a, a an issue; it is an ethical issue for our society. And I appreciate uh, very much the comments there. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, next up, we have uh, Perry Chen, Director, Social Impact, Blue Shield of California, Promise Health Plan. 
Uh, Perry, how can corporate grant making and sponsorships favorably impact the evolution towards racial equity in America? Um, thank you. I'm just really enjoying hearing everybody's uh, comments and reflections. You know, corporations have become recently become more significant players in promoting racial equity uh, by infusing much needed resources, volunteering hours, other supports for social justice initiatives. And I think you can think of it in a couple of different ways. Um, for us, you know, I, I'm overseeing corporate giving, our signature initiative, and what our employees do in terms of their give back. And I think you could look at it at some different levels. Like one, you wanna make sure that where you're investing are the places where you're really making the highest impact, you know, in terms of your goals, your outputs, your outcomes, your long-term impact. Um, and for us, doing a, a signature initiative around youth mental health, we've always, from the beginning, thought we need to reach young people who are the furthest away from opportunity. So whether it's looking at schools that are close to the border um, between California and, and Baja, or whether it's being in Oakland in deep east or deep west Oakland, where there have historically been a lack of resources, I think if you're thinking about something that brands your company around its social investment and social good, really go to the heart of where it's most needed. I think a second area I would recommend is to think about uh, not just service, but leadership and the infrastructure of the nonprofit field that you're trying to support. Uh, and in this, there's a lot of complications. So one thing our company has put out there is that we want to support organizations that are led by BIPOC leaders that have BIPOC representation on their boards, in their C-suites. Um, and it's not always easy, I think, in this sense, because that kind of information is not centralized or mandated anywhere. And so oftentimes you're trying to figure out, like, are these organizations reflecting the communities that we wanna reach? Is their leadership, is their pipeline, you know, reflecting that? And of course, at the same time, looking inward, because we can't ask that of our partners if we're not doing that ourselves. I think the, the final thing I would say is a systemic thing around corporate sponsorships and corporate giving. So let's say your systems are really set up for large partnerships, right? For large nonprofits that the kinds of requirements, the kinds of risk that you need to get managed really fit large organizations like statewide or national organizations. And let's say the data out there shows that most of those large organizations are not BIPOC led, that most BIPOC led partners tend to be small or they're local or they're grassroots. Then I think a company could really think about how do I adapt my processes that I'm still meeting all of my needs for the business, but I'm not making it a barrier, a systemic barrier for BIPOC led, BIPOC serving organizations to be those that we partner with in this space. Well, thank you, uh, Perry. And I, I know that um, we have, um, I, both of my kids have, have lived in Oakland. I've spent a lot of time there and I, I appreciate all of your um, Oakland specific uh, comments because they, they resonate so much uh, with, um, with what I've experienced um, in the city of Oakland, both the highs and, and the lows of the city of Oakland. You know, we now have a, a question for, um, I'm going to ask um, a one question for each of the panelists. Um, and I'll ask you to, uh, to hold your, 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 your answers to, to one minute if you can. Um, but the first panelist I'll ask is, of course, uh, uh, who went first, uh, Martha Santana Chen. Um, how do you personally stay focused on supporting and spreading racial equity? What keeps you going? And then we'll ask each of the other panelists the same question. So th thank you for that question. You know, I do, I do got to just make a comment. You know, Ricky, thank, thank you. I mean, I think you your comments really just resonated with me. It really did touch me. Um, I, I feel, you know, your pain. I um, experienced it personally myself. You know, having uh, grown up working in the Medi-Cal space, I see all the issues that you're addressing firsthand. And... Um, you know, for me personally, I think the point about being human and empathetic is something that I try to live by every single day. 
I mean, I, I see what's happening from a systems perspective and all of the investment that we still have to make in the communities that we serve to really get the kind of access to quality care that people deserve. We have a long ways to go. Um, but I am optimistic. I'm optimistic because the state has made considerable investments that are being implemented as we speak that I think are going to make, you know, um, some inroads. But with that said, I don't think any one of us has all the answers. We all have a lot of learning to do. And so what I always try to remember is my lived experience is my lived experience. There are many voices out there that are important to hear and to have heard so that we can inform the work that we do day in and day out. And so what I'm, I'm consistently trying to practice is the idea that active listening, being curious and empathetic um, and setting aside judgment and bias as best as you can, recognizing that you two are a human being and sometimes, you know, it, it slips. Um, if you, if we center our focus there, we're more likely to make an impact than not. So that, that's, that's what I try to really center myself on. So thank you so much. Let's turn to, uh, Marsha Chu with the same question. How do you personally stay focused on supporting and spreading racial equity? What keeps you going? I try to make my advocacy a productive outlet for my outrage. Um, and it's about changing systems and institutions because it's not about just individual racism, but it's about systems and institutions that are embedded in our culture. Um, you know, anti-black racism, the recent spate of anti-Asian violence, um, the assaults on our democracy, they're a threat to us all. And I think that there is no alternative but to continue to fight. And um, I think that if we don't fight, we don't even make the incremental progress that we that takes years and decades to realize. Um, so I try to use my voice at every opportunity, whether it's in a corporate setting or whether it's on a board. And I'm grateful for the opportunity to have been invited to many places where very, very few people look like me. And as an immigrant child who didn't um, speak English as her first language, I think finding my voice and using my voice is very, very important. Um, I'm inspired also by amazing men and women who I think live their lives brilliantly despite the many obstacles and barriers that have been presented before them. Um, but, you know, none of us succeeds without certain safety nets and without opportunity and access. And so I, as long as I have any influence or any ability to speak up and use my voice, I want to continue to make certain that access and opportunities are available to all people. So that's what keeps me going. <laughs> Marcia, thank you very much. And um, may it keep you going for a, for a very long time because uh, we certainly need that, that kind of motivation, energy, and perspective as well. Next up, uh, Ricky Miner. Again, how do you personally stay focused on supporting and spreading racial equity? What keeps you going? Well, I think that um, going to where they're, they're not going to come to us. We have to go to them and, and help to educate and empower them. And I'm talking about the underserved communities who don't feel like this is their home. Like, I don't I don't want to go. So there has to be more outreach. And I think for me, that's where I see some progress when we individually go out, personally go out inspire when i see that and i and that and when we connect again back to being human in a human level uh, a, a great when you see a need go to it do something we can't just talk about it we have to do something so i would implore everyone within the sound of this recording and beyond to if to go out and do something let's not just talk about it, let's do it 
one, and it's one person at a time. I mean, we can't look at it and go, we have to have this number. And I know the data is important, but you know, it will change one life at a time. That's it. Yes, and uh, you know, a a journey steps starts with one step forward. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Ricky, and thank you for being with us today. Thank uh, you next up is uh, is Perry Chen. And how do you personally stay focused on supporting and spreading racial equity? And what keeps you going, Perry? Yeah, I mean, thank you. I, I think, you know, racial equity is so complex, right? It permeates everything that we do. I think it's very hard to think of anything that it doesn't touch. And I think if you've been around for a while, there are times obviously when you think I have steps forward and steps back, right? I think in particular, just thinking today, a couple of my colleagues here have talked about LA and, and the riots and Rodney King. Uh, and I remember that, you know, very clearly. And I thought about it so much last year with George Floyd when everybody was saying, well, now we've recorded it and people can see it. And I kept thinking, well, we did record it almost 30 years ago and we saw it then. And, you know, I think those are the moments when you can feel like, where are we going? You know, how is this changing at all? But I, I'm encouraged that I do see incremental moves, you know, over time. I see them in places like media, right? And and I see them in places like law, uh, not always, <laughs> because obviously there are some setbacks there too. Um, I see it in resources, you know, whether it's public or private. And I think I have one advantage is that I spent a lot of my career working with young people. And I, I think maybe that's where I see it the most on the plus side for me. Right, that I think that, like when you see in, the a palpable difference that I think young people have today than they might have had before, you know, of all those places where I've seen progress and then setbacks and progress again, is probably with young people who are finding their voice and speaking up. And I think that's what keeps me going with it. Okay, I appreciate that, Perry. And again, thank you for your commitment. We're now going to go to, um, audience uh, generated questions to the panel. Uh, if you want to, um, you can uh, direct a question to a specific uh, panel member, um, Martha, Marsha, Perry, um, or Ricky, um, or you can uh, direct the question to each, uh, to the panel as a whole. So let's go uh, first to um, a question for any of the panelists. Can you share with us a time when a corporation or a brand besides your own did something to promote racial equity that inspired you? Any panelist? Oh, oh I'll go. Um, you know, everybody knows about uh, the bold leadership of Darren Walker at the Ford Foundation, um, the unprecedented uh, issuing of social bonds so that he can double giving during the pandemic, I think was especially bold and innovative and creative. Um, and, and his focus on racial equity is very inspiring to me. And another example of, of sound corporate leadership is JP Morgan Chase. They have an initiative called Advancing Black Pathways. Um, it's a $60 billion investment over five years. So their very sophisticated and thoughtful philanthropy is very strategic um, and it's very focused and intentional and, um, and it addresses systemic change. It's not a, you know, check off the box, we've done X, but to really be embedded in the community in a substantial way with substantial investments. And so those are two examples of how um, we can corporations could be better corporate citizens. Marsha, thank you. Um, does anyone want to go next? Ricky, Perry, Martha? Sure, I can go in. Um, I'm, I work with the organization called Education Through Music. Uh, there's one in New York and there's one here in LA. Uh, we service over 20,000 kids uh, in, in the underserved areas from from uh, um, from East LA, Compton, Watts, and what we've seen is their 
their grades have gone up tremendously and the school in Compton went from last to first by just having the attention and what music does to you and gives you a, a purpose to come to, to practice. They're provided with lessons and it's not that they will be a musician, but they, they belong. And having that feeling of belonging in a community gives you confidence in yourself to go out into the world. And these are the kind of, of programs that that that's that's totally pu uh, public funding funded uh, through through other corporations and with the studios here in uh, in, in in Los Angeles um, with Universal and the various studios and composers and people helping to raise awareness of what music can do and helping your your uh, your ability to belong and and grow. Uh, I have a quick example. Um, I think I've been really impressed by Salesforce and its commitment to African-American students in the Bay Area uh, for a couple reasons. I think one, they have brought in talent that has worked in the system with young people so that there's authentic knowledge informing, I think, strategies. I think two, they are in it for the long term. So I think even when initiatives like My Brother's Keeper or other local initiatives have a time frame they stick with it longer than that. And with that, they also continually learn. I think not everything that they try works, um, but that doesn't mean that if it doesn't work that they give up. I think that they, they go back and try to figure it out. Part of that is being in it for the long term. Martha. Yeah, and I mean, that the only, so Marsha took my example. I think JP Morgan Chase is doing some phenomenal work. Um, investing in, in uh, communities of color. You know, the other one that I would add is there's an organization by the name of um, Tela Verde based in Arizona, and they're doing, they, they've done great work. They've essentially turned um, helping the justice involved, justice involved women, incarcerated women who are uh, finding themselves in a place where they're going to be released back into society and basically creating a pipeline for them to come out um, with jobs at the ready. And um, the thing that I love about this company is what they did is they took a problem that was based on systemic racism and they turned it into a business model that works. It's a business model that works for the organization and it's also a business model that works for the people that are coming back into the community. They have very high success rates, you know, something I think that we really need to um, uh, replicate in, in many other markets to get at the crux of getting people back and assimilated in a successful way. Well, thank you. Thank you, Martha. Well, uh, we've come to that point um, uh, that inevitably comes along anytime you're having an exciting discussion and a wonderful panel where um, we have to bid adieu to um, everyone and our audience as well. Uh, but before that, I want to say thank you to our panel, as well as all of our other guests today, including Marvin O'Quinn. This has been a fascinating topic and we could probably, well, not probably, we, we can certainly go on all day if we wanted to, but we're just about out of time. Hopefully we've made some headway in addressing where corporate responsibility and racial equity intersect. And our audience has been left with some interesting perspectives to reflect upon and turn into actions in their own lives and roles at their respective institutions. So let's come to a close with a round of acknowledgements and thank yous. <clears throat> First, on behalf of CDU students, alumni, trustees, faculty and staff, I want to sincerely thank you, our panel and featured speaker for a thoughtful morning of conversation. <clears throat> This being the last event of the 2021 Leadership Summit Series, I also want to extend thanks to all panels and speakers who took time to participate in our previous summits throughout the year. The 2021 CDU Leadership Summit on Health Equity and Social Justice was made possible through the generous support of our sponsors and partners. Thank you to our presenting sponsor, Blue Shield of California Promise Health Plan our co-presenting sponsors, Deloitte Consulting LLP, Martin Luther King Community Hospital, and Torrey Pines Bank. Our president's friend sponsors, Diane and Steve Weingarten and family, LA Care Health Plan, and HealthNet. Our corporate sponsors, Holologic, 
Pfizer, the Southern California Gas Company, AOE Consulting, Arena Pharmaceuticals, the SLAM Collaborative, Children's Hospital Los Angeles, Illumina, Chase Bank, and Anastasia of Beverly Hills. And our virtual table sponsors, Gallagher, the Tessie Cleveland Community Cent Service Center, U.S. Bank, Anderson Barker Architects, UCLA Geffen, David Geffen School of Medicine, UCLA School of Nursing, as well as individuals such as Angela Minifield, Dr. Diane Breckenridge, Sylvie Drivey, Dr. Steve Michael, along with Compton College, Dr. Jay Vodgama, Carl McLaney, Liz Baskerville, and Dr. Calvin Johnson, as well as other organizations such as American University of Health Sciences and healthcare staffing professionals. And thank you to everyone who joined us today and throughout 2021. We wish you all a wonderful day as well as a happy and healthy holiday season right around the corner. Take care, everyone, and thank you. Thank you.